Anthony Horowitz, bit of a change up here in the middle of the month um, of horror to read a mystery book, which came in um, on my hybrid, uh, library hold list. Uh, good timing because I was getting a little burned out on the horror. And I, so I got a couple of library books that came in. Uh, I'll talk about just this one. This is the fifth one in the Horowitz, uh, the uh, Hawthorne and Horowitz series. You may notice that I said the word Hawthorne twice. The characters in this book are a police officer named Hawthorne and a mystery writer named Anthony Horowitz. Not coincidentally, the name of the author of the book. A little, a little bit of a twist on uh, Holmes and Watson. Anthony Horowitz writes these uh writes a version of himself into this series who becomes involved in the first book which was called uh, Line to Kill, I think. Oh, no, The Sentence is Death. Uh, gets involved with uh, this uh, police officer who wants him to co-write a book and they have adventures together and it's a great dynamic. I really like Anthony Hortz's books. I believe I've read all his books written for adults. He's Horowitz is at least three writers. He's probably most famous uh, throughout the world, uh, if he's famous at all, as the author of the Alex Ryder books, which are uh, middle grade books uh, about a teenage or a, a young adult uh, James Bond character, I believe. I've never read them. Um, very popular books, though. You see them all the time. I had no idea. I didn't connect the name with anything when I started reading his books. I found his books through a review originally. He also wrote many episodes of British television. Um, he wrote a lot of uh, episodes of Midsummer Murders and uh, the David Suchet Poirot uh, episodes. And created his own show, the um, with Michael Kitchener was that show about the cop, uh, the policeman working during World War II and just after World War II, uh, uh, Foils War. He wrote all those, which I find a little slow moving. I want to like that series, but I couldn't get into it. Then he wrote. Then he started a few years ago, a couple decades ago, started writing adult novel novels for adults, mystery novels for adults. First one I read, and I, I got it off a, a review in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, was called Moonflower Murders. And Moonflower Murders is a very clever idea. It's about a woman who's a uh, publisher, works in a small publishing house. She gets a manuscript delivered by this small publishing house's money-making author who is a mystery writer who writes this series of uh, sort of uh, Poirot-type uh, knockoffs, or not knockoffs, but uh, inspired by Agatha Christie. This is set in modern times, but the, the character in the book within a book is um, similar to Poirot, and he solves mysteries in the English countryside. She gets a book. It's supposed to be, uh, this writer says he's going to retire. It's going to be his last book. She takes it home. She starts reading it. And then, and she and she gives the re us, it's the first person, she gives us, the readers, a warning about how things really turn out badly and she wish she never started this book. And then we get the whole book. And it's, so it's a book within a book. Um, I won't go into the whole story of that. I highly recommend... Uh, Magpie Murders, and it also has a sequel called Moonflower Murders. Then he stopped writing those because he felt like, you know, according to interviews I've heard with him, he felt like it was really hard to keep to come up with another repeat of the same basic formula, which is this one character, I forget her name right now, unfortunately, who happens to always uh, be reading a book by this particular author, which uh, has a mystery hidden in, hint, hidden in it, which he then has to solve. So it's a little hard uh, to keep coming up with variations on that theme, I, th I think. Although I really like those books, and I really think he should just keep going with it. Just who cares how many times she finds it? I mean, how many times does uh, Jessica Fletcher, 
I always use this example, but how many times does Jessica Fletcher murder? She would go to a go to a writing conference and then somebody gets murdered and she has to solve it. Doesn't matter. And he is aware of this to some degree because his uh, he he mentions something like that in his current book, Close to Death. You know, he's talking about. I think he mentions. You know, Poirot solves like 80 murders. And then he mentions there's something in, in the un entire United Kingdom. There's like 800 murders a year. And can that really be true? There's like 60 million people in the United Kingdom. And there's only 800 murders. Maybe it was 8,000 or a lot less in the United States. So so well done, Great Britain and Northern Ireland on uh, keeping the murder rate down. Anyway, uh, he also wrote... So then after I read uh, Magpie Murders... I looked for anything I could find by him. He had written two James Bond pastiches. The first one has one of the best uh, James Bond pastiche titles I've ever heard, Trigger Mortis, which is a direct sequel to Goldfinger. So his, and the other one is called Forever in a Day, which is a prequel, like James Bond's first adventure kind of thing. They're both excellent also. If you like James Bond, they're some of the best well, other than the King's Leomus one that was written right after Ian Fleming died, or relatively right after Ian Fleming died, which is called Colonel Sun, it's re they're really the only James Bond uh, continuations I've 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 liked. I've read a few others, one by William Boyd or whoever that is, I think Solo, which I didn't care for, and um, another one by somebody. Forget it. And um, but his are really, really good and really clever. If you like James Bond, I'd give Trigger Mortis a try for sure. I read on that one. I had the audio book, which was read by Richard Ayoade, who I just happened to mention yesterday in the in the Garth Marenghi video I did. Um, and it's such a great reading of a book like it because Richard, Richard Ayoade, obviously more of a comedian, comic actor, and a comic writer, but he has just the right tone of absurdity and campiness. Not even campiness, but just because he takes the reading of this James Bond novel so seriously, but he's also got that kind of ridiculous, you know, he's got that background of, of being Moss from the IT crowd and, and stuff, so... It's just a little bit pushed up, a little too high. It's a perfect, per perfect uh, mode to be reading a James Bond adventure on, taking it seriously, but knowing he's he's not to take it seriously. I enjoyed his reading a lot. So if you if you like audiobooks, seek out the audiobook of Trigger Mortis by Anthony Horowitz, read by Richard Ayoade. Okay, and then uh, and he also wrote a couple really good. Well, one, two, two uh, really good uh, Holmes pastiches. Uh, one really good one, and one that irritated the hell out of me, which kind of relates to the current book here. So uh, the first one's House of Silk, which is a Holmes and Watson adventure. The second one's called Moriarty, which is about the hunt for uh, Moriarty. It takes place right at after the Reichenbach Falls affair, where uh, Holmes is presumed dead and Moriarty is presumed dead in the actual uh, canon, you know, uh, Doyle canon. And uh, there's, I don't want to say he doesn't play fair because he does play fair, but there are some twists in that book that kind of piss me off anyway. Even though as you read the book, at least as I read the book, I, you're like, okay, you know, I see you know, he didn't really, he, he didn't cheat. But also, I'm not sure I'm ha happy at being fooled to that level in a book. Anyway, moving on to this current series, and like I, I think I said already, this is the close to death, the one I'm reviewing now, or one I'm reacting to now, is the fifth book in the Hawthorne and Horowitz series. And the reason I thought it was worth going into talking about Anthony Horowitz's career um, up to this point is because it really plays into the character, the fictional version of himself that he narrates these Hawthorne um, and Horowitz adventures with. The first one starts out, he gets 
contacted by this guy named Hawthorne, who he doesn't really want to meet, who's an ex-cop, who's got like a sort of dicey background. This cop decides um, they had apparently met uh, at another time and he had been a consultant. Hawthorne had been a consultant on one of the TV shows that Hawthorne, that um, Horowitz worked on, um, both the fictional Horowitz, Horowitz in the novel and the real Horowitz because he folds in all his other uh, work into this. He, you know, he is the character in the book is the author of the Alex Ryder books. He is the creator of Foyle's War. He is writing a screenplay for for Steven Spielberg and gets uh, fired in a hilarious way. Um, so it's like a comic exaggerated version of himself and all his projects and how busy he is. And he meets this... Uh, and he uh, gets contacted by this person who'd consulted before on one of his cop shows. And this guy has this great idea, Hawthorne has this great idea to that they should collaborate. Like Hawthorne will give him, uh, tell him about one of his uh, major successes and Hawthorne and, and Horowitz will write it up and they'll split the money. And this is a, a thing that happens often to famous writers, at least from what I've read, and even not so famous writers, where somebody will come along with a stupid idea, and or even a good idea, and want the writer to do all the work. And like, here's my idea, I'll tell him in five minutes, and, and now you spend the six months, six months writing it and develop it into a, a book. Uh, because that's the easy part, and and you can get and you can keep half the money, so that's the initial premise. Uh, there there is a mystery they're involved in, and uh, the book is a big success, and so they have to keep writing books. Anthony Horowitz really doesn't like this person, um, Hawthorne, all that much. Hawthorne's a pretty difficult person to like. He seems kind of racist. Seems kind of homophobic. Uh, seems kind of arrogant. He is a brilliant, brilliant detective. Somehow uh, fired from the force for uh, for police brutality. Um, but still being constantly consulted by the police because he's such a brilliant detective. So it's that dynamic of the comic sidekick, you know, Hastings or... Uh, Watson's not really a comic sidekick in the books, in the stories, but Watson's kind of a comic sidekick in a lot of the various uh, media adaptions over the years, especially the Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce movies. So it's that kind of dynamic. And, and uh, unfortunately for for the character Anthony Horowitz, the books he writes about Hawthorne are f much more popular and much more successful than his other books, so he has to keep writing them. And he has to keep getting involved. And over the course of the books, we're up to five books, uh, Horowitz finds out more and more about Hawthorne. You know, he finds out that the police brutality case was uh, involved him throwing a suspect on the stairs. And then he finds out that the suspect was actually a child pornographer. You know, something he likes him a little more. And then he find, he's got this sort of quite weird living situation where there's like a... You know, he's got in his building. He's got a, a, a young, uh, the son of a neighbor who's a cyber genius guy who's got you know, can ta tap into any sort of network and get any kind of uh, information he needs off the web. So he's got sort of an operation going on. It's not really clear how he can afford to live where he's living, and he tells stories about how he's house-sitting for his brother, and his brother turns out not to be his brother, and he's got some strange uh, book club in, downstairs, so he's very well-read, and he's always surprising um, Hawthorne by how, I mean, Horowitz by how well-read he is. So the mystery gets, so there's the mysteries that they, they, they uncover throughout the course of the books, but there's also the general mystery of what's the deal with this Hawthorne guy, which makes the books very compelling, and that, that is the core of those, of these, Horowitz and, and um, Hawthorne novels is the ongoing mystery of what's the deal with this brilliant detective Hawthorne. So that's why I like reading them. In a way, they remind me of... Or I like them for the same reason I like... They don't really remind me this much of it, but I like them for the same reason I like 
very much one of my favorite series, my favorite comic mystery series, and probably people take issue with me calling it a comic uh, series or a light series, is the Nero Wolf books by Rex Stout, where you've got the brilliant cantankerous detective Nero Wolf, who's older and very difficult to deal with and uh, brilliant and refuses to leave the house and his operative who is the narrator of the books Archie Goodwin who is uh, uh, a younger guy who has to do all the legwork but also tells the stories and and does it with a very acerbic uh, um, or jaundiced point of view maybe um, you know towards towards Wolf's uh, cantankerousness and stuff so he's kind of like an anti Watson in that and then in the sense that Watson is always, you know, very non-judgmental and very, uh, you know, worshipful and straightforward in his opinions about Holmes and Archie God Godwin will get in the jabs at Nero Wolf. So I really recommend those books. Those are the best. But like those, uh, you know, the story, the plots are fine. But what you read, what I read in Nero Wolf for is. You know, some of the plots are better than others. Some of them are not interesting at all. What's always interesting, though, is Archie Goodwin's narrative voice and the interplay between himself and Nero Wolf, his boss, and the other uh, side characters, you know, these other operatives they work with or, you know, their dealings with the police, that kind of thing. And this, these... Uh, Hawthorne and Horowitz books, that's why they work too, I think. It's really more about the characters interplaying, although the plots, uh, some of them are pretty good. The first couple are, are really good because uh, they involve, you know, the pub publishing world and and Horowitz is usually involved in some kind of doomed project somehow uh, or he's invited to a writing conference and no one really wants to meet him or... or things like that. So they're quite funny in that sense, and he portrays himself as like inept and getting into trouble, and Hawthorne bails him out. And so I enjoyed uh, reading uh, uh, reading about that more than some of the individual plots, especially this one I think is probably the weakest in the series because there's less of the Hawthorne and Horowitz stuff. It starts out, there's a, another group of characters uh, for about the first 50, 60 pages. And it's pretty obvious, you know, you, you know you're reading a mystery. You know who the main characters are. So you know that these people that we're reading about in the first section are the people who are going to be involved in this crime somehow. It's set in a wealthy uh, London suburb. Um, Finally, it switches to the point of view of Anthony Horowitz, and he right away acknowledges that he that you're probably pretty irritated at this point that you've gone this far into one of his own one of his novels without hearing, you know, his voice or whatever. So he's very aware of all these kind of things. This uh, mystery in this one sort of as a, a locked room, not a locked room mystery. Oh yeah, it is a locked room mystery. It's also a closed circle mystery. Anthony Horowitz. Uh, you know, obviously an expert on that kind of thing from all his uh, Christie adaptions and Midsummer Murders adaptions and things. So he has a lot of commentary about the that form, which I also like. But um, and there is a big revelation. You know, there's some big revelations about uh, Hawthorne's character in this book too. So it carries that overall story forward. However, what I did miss is it doesn't really seem to have as much uh, interaction between Hawthorne and Horowitz because in this, just the way this is set up, this is structured differently than, than the other books. This is one where Horowitz is going back and reconstructing a case that Hawthorne's already finished. And I wonder if it's because uh, Horowitz doesn't like to repeat himself like I was saying about that other series of a book within a book that he starting to wonder if it's strange the the credulity that every time uh Hawthorne and Anthony Horowitz meet they somehow get mixed up in a new murder and Anthony War Horowitz almost bungles it um so this is a little different where he's more in after the fact but he does find out some interesting stuff about Hawthorne and I, uh for all that I would I would say it's not the best in the series it's uh 
I would still keep reading them because I really want to know what the whole deal with Hawthorne is. I don't know how many books he's going to drag it out for before we find out all, all, all of Hawthorne's secrets. He has seemed to slow down the pace of revealing Hawthorne's secret over the last few books. But yeah, the main reason I read Anthony Horowitz and read everything he writes as an, that comes out for adults, I've never really been moved to try the middle grade books. I just don't, they just don't grab me. Um, you know, the concept of, of those, I'm sure they're, they're great. I would, um, I just can't see myself reading 50 uh, books about a 14-year-old James Bond. Um, or how many ever there are. There are a bunch of them, though. And I can't believe when I started reading Anthony Horowitz that I didn't notice that he was the same person who had written all these Alex Ryder books. Because there's so many, they're all over the place. If you're in bookstores or any place where books are around, you've seen these books, even if you don't know the name Anthony Horowitz. You know, and if you know young people with uh, young boys who read, you definitely know these books. So anyway, I'll keep reading them and you keep reading what you're reading. I'll do an update on the whole week tomorrow and we'll see what we'll see.